fast. I was not quite in at the groundbreaking of the organization. I was president of Asbury College at the time, and uh, Harold Burgess was working with Dr. Kinlaw, uh, thinking about, okay, what would Dr. Kinlaw be when he grew up? <laughs> and out of that came the birth of the society. And I remember very clearly Dr. Kinlaw saying, and some of you have seen this in print. Uh, he said, the Asbury institutions, then Asbury College, Asbury Seminary, were born out of the belief that holiness is a genuine possibility in the human life. 1890, when the college was formed, that was the burning vision in John Wesley Hughes' mind. And it was the same for Henry Clay Morrison when he founded the Theological College as part of Asbury College in 1923. But Dr. Kinlaw said, the problem with institutions is an institution will make its own survival primary and in the midst of that lose the message. We need a society, a group of people not an organization, not an institution that, again, will try to preserve itself. We need a group of people, a society, who have a shared dream, who will preserve the message for the sake of these institutions. And that's what FAS has been across the years. People who believe in full salvation. I don't know who it was who said, maybe it was... Um, Shane, who said, I asked somebody, what's your view of salvation? I'm going to talk about that. That makes all the difference. What does it mean to be saved, biblically speaking? So seeing you, and especially some of you who are infants, <coughs> <laughs> under the age of 40, <laughs> Is, is so thrilling to me because this, when the organization began, there were, there were seven or eight young men with burning hearts, fellas like that kid Bill Kearse back there, <laughs> who, who were in love with God and with the message and wanted to see it spread. So some of you have said to me, what in the world are you doing becoming interim president at this stage of the game? at this stage in your life. Well, I said, <laughs> I think I've found my life calling. It's temp work. <laughs> but it's very much as it was for me with Wesley Biblical Seminary when I heard the news that John Nahoff had died. There was the impetus. Offer yourself. And when I heard, and it, it was not a surprise, when I heard that Ron was going to go to uh, OCU, uh, it, it's made for him. He's made for it. But when I heard that word, there, there in my soul was, I think, the voice of God saying, you need to offer yourself. So I don't come to the position with any... <laughs> illusion about my capacities as an administrator. But, but my desire is simply to be the placeholder. More than that, the placeholder, the, the finger forward until God brings us his person. And he's going to. And, and I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being here. You are FAS. Uh, when Stan Key became president, he said to me, what is FAS? And I said, it's the covenant members. It's the people who have signed a card that said, I will pray every day. I will read the word every day. I'll be in church. I'll pray for FAS. 
I'll support FAS because I believe the message. You're it. You're it. We're it. And that's good. That's good. So thank you. Thank you for your involvement in this society. Not an organization. Of course it's an organization. But above everything else, it's a society. It's a group of people, like-minded people, who care about one another and care about the message and long to see it spread. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this group. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for all of the inspiration. Thank you for all of the conviction. Thank you for all of the ways in which you've spoken to us. And now, Lord, we think you want to speak to us some more. And so I pray that you'll do that. Speak through me, through halting, stumbling lips. You speak. If we only hear a man, we die. But if we hear the voice of God, we live. Speak to us, O oh Lord. In your name, amen. What is the most disregarded phrase in Scripture? I, we could probably bring forward a number of suggestions, but I have one example that I want to share with you, and I think it is, we rip right over that. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, thy kingdom come on, what? What did we just say? The first sentence in the Lord's Prayer after the vocative, Our Father who art in heaven, the very first petition Jesus puts in our mouths, Hallowed be thy name. Now, what in the world does that mean? What are, what are we talking about? Well, we all know we're not talking about J-E-S-U-S -S or G-O-D. One of, one of our graduates went to Cambridge University, and you know the colleges there have different names, and they compete with one another, rowing on the cam. He said it was always a little disconcerting to hear them yelling, Go, Jesus! Go, Jesus! Beat them, Jesus! <laughs> Jesus College. <laughs> We're not talking about a label. We're talking about his character, his reputation. Oh, God. Let the world see you in all of your wonder. Let them see you in all of your glory. Let them see you in your unstoppable power. Let them see you as you really are. Through me this week. But, but now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't, isn't his name already holy by definition? <laughs> I mean, it's God's reputation, therefore it's holy. His reputation is holy. So what are we talking about? I want to take you to a passage in the Old Testament that I think will help us in that regard. I hope that's big enough for you to see. This is in the second part of the book of Ezekiel where he's talking now about Jerusalem is going to be restored for some 15 years. No, no, some 18 years. He has said Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and they've said no way. Now destroyed and they're in total despair and he says Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt and they say no way. How would you like to have that congregation? <laughs> you say you're going to hell and they say never. You say you're going to heaven and they say not a chance. <laughs> and so he says, I scattered them to many lands to punish them for the evil way they lived. Yeah. But when they were scattered among the nations, they profaned my holy name. Now, you've had the experience. You've read a passage many times, and one day it 
stops you. I had that experience with this one. I got that far. I said, oh, my goodness. When God exiled them, they were cursing God's name. They were profaning his name. Then I read the rest of the verse. That's the most important principle in Bible study. Read the rest of the verse. For the nations said, these are the people of Yahweh. But he couldn't keep them safe in his own land. <laughs> Holy, glorious, marvelous, powerful. No, 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 no. A little helpless fella. Don't feel bad, Israelites. Our gods can't help us half the time either. It's all right. It's all right. Everywhere they went, they profaned my holy name. Think of that. All you have to do to profane God's name is make him appear little and helpless. That's all you have to do. He can't deliver me from my old habits. He can't deliver me from my old ways of thinking. He can't deliver me. Everywhere they went, they profaned. They didn't hallow his name. They profaned it. <laughs> and you sort of get the idea that he is a bit upset about this. See all the red up there? <laughs> then I was concerned for my holy name, which my people had profaned among the nations. Therefore, give the people of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord. I'm bringing you back, but not because you deserve it. I'm going to do it to protect my holy name, which you profaned among the nations. I'll show how holy my great name is, uh, the name which you profaned among the nations, in case you didn't get that yet. <laughs> and when I am hallowed through you before their eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the I am. Hmm. Hallowed be thy name. So, how's he going to do that? How is he going to show the world who he really is through this bunch. This bunch. Well, he says, I'm going to take you home again. I'm going to deliver you from the consequences of your sin. Why are they in exile in Babylon? Because they've sinned. Consequences. God says, okay, okay. The world says, you're in this mess because I'm too weak to do anything about it. So obviously, I'm going to have to deliver you from this mess. I'm going to take you home again. Now, nobody had ever gone home from exile. The whole purpose of exile was to, to dissolve a people into the em empire. 350 years, Assyria had been practicing exile, and then Babylon learned from their northern sister. 350 years, nobody had ever gone home. But the, dis the prophets said, God's going to take you home. No way. No way. Hasn't ever happened before. And God says, I'm not one of the gods. The gods can't do a new thing. The gods are locked into the endless cycles of nature. The sun's never going to come up in the West. I guarantee it. But God can do a new thing. He in fact, can give somebody new birth. Poor old Nicodemus. Huh? What? What are you talking about? 
I'm supposed to go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus says, ay, 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 ay. I can do a new thing. So I'm going to take you home again. You thought it was over. You thought your condition was helpless. You thought you had offended God once too often. But it's not over. I'm going to take you home. Praise his name. Praise his name. And some of us can testify to it. Now, For most of the church, that's it. That's it. Your sins are forgiven. You're declared innocent before the court of heaven. So just sit there and wait till the bus comes. Ezekiel is just starting. He's just starting in what he's saying about how the world is going to know who he is. Yes, in his power to deliver, we see his grace. We see his power. But what about his character? <coughs> what about his nature? What kind of a God is he? I'm going to take you home. And I'm going to cleanse you from all your idols. In the Bible, God, Yahweh, is clean. And whatever is disassociated from him is by definition unclean. He is light, and whatever is not him is dark. He is clean, and whatever is not, clean, and not him is unclean. And oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Putting something else in the place of God corrupts it. The leper with his bell, unclean, unclean. And how have we rendered ourselves unclean? By putting an idol on his throne. There is something in the human heart that is <laughs> irretrievably, it seems, idolatrous. Because you see, this, this idea of a transcendent God that we cannot manipulate is frightening. How do I get him to pay off? Surrender and trust? I don't think so. No, no, I want a God that I can manipulate. You see, I have desires. I have needs. How am I going to get those needs met? The idolatrous heart says, by learning how to manipulate the world. That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is not making little statues. Idolatry is manipulating the powers of the world to meet your desires. It's no accident that the Bible calls idols abominations unclean things, filthy things. How do you make yourself filthy? Just put something else on the throne of God. So what's he going to do? He's going to restore himself to the altar of the temple. I'm going to cleanse you from your idolatry. That's what I've got to do for you. I've got to bring you to the place where, number one, 
you have surrendered your desires into my hands. God, you meet my desires your way in your time as you choose. That's clean. That's clean. So many Christians, Christians are unclean because they're idolaters. God exists to satisfy their needs and that's to make him an idol. I'm going to take you home again. I'm going to get you out of the Babylon. And then I'm going to cleanse you from your idols. What are your idols? I haven't seen the statistics recently, but 30 years ago, people who went into the ministry had the highest need for approval of any profession. Tell me I'm doing a good job. <laughs> like me. Idols? Idols? The most dangerous thing of the ministry is becoming familiar with holy things. You learn how to pray. You learn how to speak. You learn how to manipulate people. All idols. All idols. I have needs, and I've learned how to meet them. Have mercy upon us, O God. Have mercy upon us. But he's still going. <laughs> Idolatry deals with the issue of desire. And it's interesting. We're not different from the Buddhists there. We both agree desire is a problem. They say the way to handle it is kill it. <laughs> Jesus says the way to handle it is turn it over. This step is dealing with the other issue. The will. Here's the bottom line in many ways. The hard heart that says, I will have my way. This is what destroys churches, destroys families. This is what destroys everything it meets. I will have my way. Here, here is the surrender of myself. And the self manifests itself in so many ways. Self-defense. I heard a story years ago that I've loved. There was an evangelist in town, and he was preaching on a Sunday night. And on Monday morning, a young man came to the office of the pastor of his church and said, the, the evangelist said, Pastor A isn't a believer. Oh, my goodness. Huh. Why in the, what in the world is he thinking? What a terrible thing. That's got to be stopped. And, and sir... He said that, that Pastor B is an unbeliever. Oh, how could he say a thing like that? What a terrible, terrible, scurrilous slander. And sir, he said, Pastor C is not a believer. Oh, my. Well, we'll have to take steps to deal with that. Uh, but sir, he, he said, you're not a believer. Leave me. I must pray. 
self-defense. They can't say that about me. Or can they? Self-promotion. Nobody else will toot my horn, so I guess I'll have to. Self-aggrandizement. <coughs> In some ways, the Methodist system is devilish. Oh, you're doing so well here in this country parish. But you know, if you would just, uh, don't be quite so forceful in your calls for a new birth. Uh, I could see you in a, in a uh, county seat church. Or, or, or if you'd be a little more careful. Now, I, I, don't change your beliefs. No, 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 no. But just be a little more careful. Why, you, you might even be in the first church someday. And how many men and women have sold their souls for self-aggrandizement? Self-fulfillment. Why am I doing this? I'm doing it because I find fulfillment in it. I will have my way. And Ezekiel says, there's only one treatment for that, and that's the sledgehammer. This is the place, it seems to me, where crisis and process come so hand in glove. Rocks don't ever slowly become rubble. <laughs> They've got to be broken. <coughs> but when they're broken, there's rubble that remains. When I, as a sophomore in college, gave my entire life to Jesus, I thought that was the end of the process. It was the beginning. <laughs> and I, I imagine it somewhat like this. Have you ever seen a video of a building destruction? You know, that they, have, they have put dynamite on all the pillars in the building. There it stands. There it stands. And you watch the construction engineer push down the electric plunger, and all of a sudden, whoosh, one moment, the building is gone. But how many months is it going to take to haul away the rubble? I keep thinking that God is going to get done hauling away the rubble in my life. Not yet. <laughs> but, but, the building is down. I am his. My will, my way is his by his grace. All glory to him. And the process goes on. John, do you realize what you just did? I thought that was impossible for me. And Satan stands by with a whip. You failure. You fool. <laughs> and Jesus stands by with nail-pierced hands and says, I died for you. I'm going to smash that rock. But the question is, have I ever really allowed him to smash it? Have I ever invited him to smash it? So that the process may indeed be carried out to the end, to the end. 
But he's still not done. <laughs> what in the world? I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. It's always fascinating to me that already in Genesis 6, 5, <laughs> barely six chapters into the book, King James, the imaginations of the thoughts of their hearts were only evil <coughs> all the time. That's called original sin. And the word for that is translated imagination has to do with shaping. And the word that's translated thoughts is interesting because it's, it's an ambiguous word. I think maybe the best English equivalent is designs. Because design can be very beneficial <laughs> or it can be very negative. He had designs on her. The Hebrew word chashav is the same way. The, the designs of our hearts, the very way we go about shaping them is anti-creation. That's ra, that's evil. All the time. Oh my goodness. If you and I are to live the life of Jesus, we've got to have what David cried out for, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, can you cleanse my imagination the way I shape the designs of my heart? As, as you know, heart in the Old Testament is not the center of affection. It's the center of the personality. It's where you think, it's where you will, it's where you feel. It's the core. Oh God, oh God, at the very core of my being, make me clean. And what did I say? All God's, all yours. I like to say, without a limit, without a rival. A new heart and a new spirit. The spirit, and, and it's, it's interesting to think about this. The spirit and the soul. The Bible sometimes uses them almost interchangeably. But it's the wind that blows through your life. It's the air that people around you breathe from you. It's what motivates you. And Hosea says, we have a spirit of prostitution. Mm. Mm. Something in us that prefers the tainted and the prohibited. Isn't it amazing? Tell me I can't and it's the thing I want most in the world. All of you who have children have experienced this. It's a spirit that is completely unstable. I don't like faithfulness. I don't like being stuck in one direction or one place. I think I'll try that direction that is kind of edgy. David says, renew, King James says, a right spirit. It's really an established spirit, a founded spirit. Give me a spirit that is able to be faithful in the most difficult circumstances. 
enables me to be faithful. When everything in me is saying, come on, this isn't paying off. Let's try. Stephen Lawler, who is now the pastor of uh, Christ Methodist in Memphis, spoke in chapel this week, and, and he told the story of their beginning ministry, and the conference had no money for a church plant, but he felt called to plant a church, so they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll get an apartment for you, three-room apartment, but we don't have any money for furniture. We don't have any money for gas, but if you want to do this, go ahead. So they did. He said he named his old Volvo Lazarus because it died so many times and had to be resurrected. <laughs> and after four years when things were not going well, he was saying, no, this is it. I'm done. Friends had invited them, as I recall, to a weekend on the beach. So they got up off their mattress on the floor, packed their two or three things in a battered suitcase and got into Lazarus and headed for the airport. He had $11. Lazarus died on the way to the airport. He said he looked over at his wife, who had been saying, no, no, God has called us to this. This is what we need to do. He looked over at his wife and he said, we're done. She said, okay. <laughs> Shortened the story. They got a taxi. In the taxi, He's watching the meter. Driver says, what do you do? I'm a church planter. Oh, really? Oh, man. Oh, that's great. And he said, as it passed 11, he said, uh, sir, I don't have, the man reached over, turned off the meter, said, I was a pastor once. I left the ministry. Worst thing I ever did in my life. He said, we decided to go on. We decided to go on. That's a right spirit, folks. That's an established spirit. That's a fixed spirit. Not an adulterous one. Can God do that for you and me? Yes. Yes, yes. May every breeze that blows through your life and mine be a breeze that's blowing us closer home. A new heart and a new spirit. And how's he going to do all that? Come on, Ezekiel. What are you talking about here? What kind of renovation does that involve? Who could do that? I will put my spirit within you. <clears throat> I, I, I get a little bit annoyed by some people who, whenever they talk about the American holiness movement, have a sort of a snide note. You know, well, Wesley, he got it right, but, you know, Phoebe Palmer and Hannah Whittles, no, I mean, my goodness. Uh, yeah. What was the problem with Phoebe Palmer and Hannah Whittle Smith? They thought that God could sanctify you now. Alter theology. I know about the longer way and the middle way and the shorter way and all that. But I believe 
that there is a moment in our lives when God has prepared us. God has brought us to the place where we know He can do this for me. To be sure, if we suggest, oh, you can be sanctified whenever you're ready. This is the work of God, not the work of man. But when God is ready, <laughs> when God is ready, and you know he's ready, that's the moment. That's the moment for him. As I like to say in the, in the illustration of Robert Munger, when the Holy Spirit ceases to become the guest and becomes the owner. <laughs> yes, yes. We can believe God to do his work in a moment. And we need to give people that good news. Again, we need to be very careful not to suggest that it's up to them. But on the other hand, when God's ready, they need to make themselves ready. I like Leviticus 22, 31 and 32. Sanctify yourselves... Because I, the Lord your God, am sanctifying you. Yeah. 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 That moment, that moment is the end of one process. When God is bringing us to the point, as A.W. Tozer says, of despair and desolation. Romans 7. That's the end of that process. The Spirit's coming. And it's the beginning of another process. And look at the consequences. I will put my spirit in you so that You can jump up and say, Glora. Well, yes. <laughs> but that's not what Ezekiel says, is it? <laughs> so that you can manifest my life. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Got to, it's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but more than that, I believe in the fruits of the Spirit. Oh, how desperately. Our country needs men and women in whom the fruits of the Spirit are just growing beautifully, naturally. People of integrity, when they're in a cesspool of lies, people of faithfulness, when everything in our society says, you don't like her, get her. I'll put my spirit in you so that you can live like me. <laughs> my first year in seminary, <clears throat> the year before Karen and I married, uh, we had a, an evangelist here in the Methodist church. I believe it was Harry Blackburn. And he had a mannerism. He'd get excited and he'd say, whoop, goody. <laughs> My roommate picked up on that <laughs> the rest of the year. <laughs> I heard, whoop, goody. Well, I tend to get sort of that way here. Yeah. Yes. We can live the life of God. Yeah. And then, best of all, the thing that God has been working on since the book of Exodus, you'll be my people and I'll be your God. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> I think, I think of Edwin Hatch's lovely hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew that I may love what thou dost love. 
and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is clean. Until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine. Till this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Our sister was talking about a couple of professors here who glowed. <laughs> yeah. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with thee. the perfect life of thine eternity. And then I think of a couple verses from George Crowley's hymn. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth. Through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. And then the last verse, I can never get away from it. Teach me to love thee as thine angels love. One holy passion filling all my frame. The kindling of the heaven descended dove. My heart an altar and thy love the flame. May I suggest to you that's salvation. That's salvation. Having my sins forgiven and waiting for the bus? No. No. So what are we praying? Hallowed be thy name. Oh God. Yes, thank you for having delivered me from the consequences of my sin. Thank you for the assurance in my heart that I'm headed for heaven. But oh God, oh God, cleanse me from my idolatrous desires. Break the hard heart of my will. I will have my way. Give me a new heart and a new spirit so that the world can say, wow, what a God. What a God. I've never seen a God like that before. Amen.